Welcome, everyone. We are delighted to have such a good crowd today for one of my favorite people in the universe. Uh, so really terrific. I, I want to um, acknowledge that this is a part of a memorial lecture series in, in memory of the wonderful uh, Eliza Forrest K. Bromf Bromfield, who was um, a beloved staff member who, who left us too quickly. Uh, Judy is uh, a person who is distinguished by having a quite a start to 2020. She publishes an autobiography. She is a central figure in a film. Um, so this is, you know, Crip Camp, A Disability Revolution, um, and Being Human, an unrepentant memoir of a disability rights activist. And right on the heels of that, the whole world sort of slips into a a new, a new way of being with the COVID-19 pandemic and everything changes and everything keeps changing. So we want to make sure that this is an opportunity for the book tour that was abbreviated to continue and for people to appreciate this extraordinary gift to all of us um, in, in Judy's book. And um, I just want to begin with, with a couple of a quick notes. One of them is, is the very beginning of Judy's book, the opening line, I never wished I didn't have a disability, um, which I think is, it's, it's a critically important fact. Um, and then the, the, if you've read the book, and if you haven't read the book, you must read the book. Um, from my time at camp, I knew what it felt like to be treated like a regular girl. However much a star Judy is, she is also, of all things, a regular girl, though also like no one else. I have to tell you that one of the great joys of my work nationally and internationally is that I have met friends of Judy, mostly young people with disabilities, across the globe. And in every case, they don't know her because they went to a lecture. They know her because they've had a personal conversation with her. Uh, and that is not ordinary. That, that You may be a regular girl, but in no way is that is that fact, an or, a fact about a regular girl. That is an extraordinary commitment, um, a passionate commitment to people across the planet with disabilities that has made enormous difference in so many people's lives. So let's begin in talking about how did you happen to finally say, I'm ready to tell my story. There's been a lot of push for a long time that this was such a good story, it needed to be captured. Well, I think, I think, first of all, thank you very much for inviting me to participate in today's event. And let me also say that as a wildly extroverted person. Um, the lockdown is one that for some of my friends who are introverts, they're like, it's not such a big deal. But for me, when Valerie was talking about people that she meets around the world who have met me and I engage in discussion, <laughs> it's as much for me as it is for them because <laughs> it's really the way I learn about what's going on in a deeper way by really having conversations with people. And, you know, this last six months, as Valerie was saying, have been extraordinary. Um, the book and the film coming out a month apart, that was not planned. COVID and then the Black Lives Matter. And I have to say that um, one of the important aspects of the Black Lives Matter um, explosion uh, really has been for me an opportunity to reflect more deeply on the types of discrimination that I and other disabled people, um, black disabled people, people of color, on and on, um, have faced. And I think really um, I'm hoping that one of the outcomes from this really powerful expansion because it's not that Black Lives Matter movement just came about. It really is, I think, the graphic nature of the murdering of George Floyd that really allowed people, forced people, to really have to look at something that uh, many of us were not necessarily willing to look at as deeply as we should have. So I, I want to combine that into 
everything going on because for me, um, you know, the book came about after many people had said to me, you need to write your story. And I'm, I'm not, I do not define myself as a writer. So I said from the very beginning, when I was finally reached out by a company that was interested in helping me um, identify someone I could write with, get an agent, um, that when that happened, it was a great opportunity for me to work with Kristen Joyner on uh, thinking back over the course of my life, the different stages of my life and um, how I've grown as a person. And I'm hoping that in the book, if you get to read it and in the film and the two of them, I think complement each other very well. Certainly in the book, you can go more deep. I was able to go more deeply into stories that are of a personal nature. Um, and I hope that one of the aspects that people can see in that book is it wasn't just that I was a young person who had polio moving through my life to different, um, you know, age. When you're young, whether you have a disability or not, you're typically growing and maturing and thinking and learning about yourself. Um, I think really having to um, dig more deeply into who I was, how I've gotten here. And I think some of the more um, painful experiences that I went through, and let me just say that this book, while it's about me, it's my memoir, one of the things that I've really liked is the number of people who have written me or contacted me in various ways who said that this is their story. Mm -hmm. And I think that's very important to me because as I always say, what happened to me has happened to others and continues to happen to people today. And I think the outcome of all this is our being able to speak up and out both individually and as a movement. Thank you, Judy. And, and, and I think your, your point about uh, referencing George Floyd, I mean, part of what is so powerful about that, why it could be such a dramatic catalyst is that it told a visual story that you couldn't deny it. Um, and I think that is, you know, it, it, we need to recognize the power of how stories are told. Um, and, and for those of you that haven't seen uh, Crip Camp, um, <clears throat> you really must. Um, it's delightful. It's great fun. Those that weren't around um, in those, um, those, those heady days of the 70s, um, it really is just down the road from, uh, uh, from Woodstock, and it feels like Woodstock for kids with disabilities. It's really a treat, and it's the only film I have ever seen that had 100% Rotten Tomatoes. Um, that's as good a rating as you can get from the place that most of us turn to to know if it's worth watching. Um, uh, we're going to ask Judy to read from the book, and, and I've asked her to read uh, a particular moment when she was 22 years old, um, and she had, um, she had just uh, realized that she, she needed to take some action, that things were not going to go her way without, uh, without actually filing a lawsuit. She had no idea how to do it, uh, and I think it, it's, just a, it, it's just a terrific moment. So, Judy, if you would you would read. Um, also, I think, you know, part of the backdrop was whether or not I would do a lawsuit. Mm. So I really hadn't, the passage that um, Valerie and I selected, I think really um, explains why I finally made the decision to uh, move ahead with the lawsuit. And, and the background is that I had um, applied to be a teacher in New York City, and I was denied my right to be a teacher uh, officially from the Board of Education in New York City, paralysis of both lower extremities, sequelae of poliomyelitis. So I had passed all the required exams, the written and the oral, and it was the medical that I was failed on because I couldn't walk. I was in my apartment on Willoughby Street in Brooklyn, my roommate, Lori, picked up the paper for us. 
Judy, Judy, she was waving the paper in front of her face. There was an article about my being denied the right to teach by the Board of Education. My mouth fell open. Although I'd been expecting it, the article blew me away. It was huge. The next day, the New York Times wrote an editorial in support of my getting a job. That afternoon, I get a call. The man on the phone introduced himself as Roy Lucas. He was a lawyer with the James Madison Constitutional Law Center and informed me in a pleasant, understand, sorry, understated kind of way that he'd read the article in the Times and would love to interview me for a project he was doing on civil rights. Right away, I thought, a lawyer with knowledge of civil rights is calling me? It felt like a godsend. So while he was interviewing me, I decided to interview him. From the question he asked and the way he spoke, I could tell he was intelligent and perceptive. At the end of the call, I asked if he would be willing to represent me as my lawyer. He agreed. Excitedly, I hung up the phone and cheered. Roy Lucas's calling me out of the blue was like a miracle. It wasn't until much later that I learned just what a miracle it really was. Roy would go on to become one of America's most preeminent lawyers for abortion rights. In addition, short, in fairly short order, he would join the team who argued the monumental Roe versus Board, uh, sorry, Roe versus Wade case before the Supreme Court, which legalized abortion in 1973. As a third-year law student at New York University, Roy had been the first person to articulate how constitutional privacy protection for married couples, use of birth control, could be expanded into, le into a legal argument for constitutional protection of a woman's right to an abortion, which was the foundation of the legal argument used in Roe v. Wade. Just six months before he called me, he had filed the first abortion rights lawsuit in New York. Roy would end up being in almost all the abortion rights cases filed across the country for the next four years. But his interest in civil rights crossed every issue. He fundamentally believed in the rights of people with disabilities and took on my case with tremendous conviction that what we were doing was right and absolutely necessary. The next day, a man who was a customer at my father and uncle's butcher shop, Elias Schwarzbart, offered to represent me as well. Suddenly, from a place of feeling utter helplessness about how to go about finding, finding legal representation, I found myself with a team of lawyers. It just shows how things can work if you follow your instincts and trust that you figure out any problems along the way. A media out onslaught now began. The New York Post joined the New York Times, running an editorial and supported me the New York Daily News ran an article with the headline, You Can Be President, Not Teacher with Polio. Reporter after reporter called, and article after article came out across the country. With all these interviews, I felt like I'd been thrown into the pool at the deep end. I had zero experience of public speaking, but amazingly, I found that the practice I'd been discussing issues at my family table had prepared me. My father had trained me out of any tendency I might have had to be quiet and unassuming. He taught me to be bold and go for it. Interrupt. Do whatever you need to do to get your point across. But when a producer from today called and invited me to appear on the show, I got nervous. They wanted me, they wanted to set up a debate between me and Bob Herman, who was an official with the U.S. Office of Special Education at the Department of Education. When I heard this, I froze. I didn't think I could do it. But then I just thought, okay, I'll go to make this, I'm gonna make this work. I may have no idea what I'm doing, but I'm gonna do it. My fear didn't completely disappear, but I was able to do it. And as the next challenge came, I simply moved forward. Thank you, Judy. Uh, I, I, I think that there's this moment when thinking about um, this very young woman um, suddenly thrust into um, opportunity is also highly 
attuned to the idea that this is incredibly risky. Um, and yet you took that risk at that moment and you've kept taking risks all these years that it's always been about. I don't know exactly where this all goes, but it's, it's important to do and I'm going to find out what happens, but I'm not afraid. And I think that courage and risk-taking appetite are absolutely central. So should we give people a chance to um, I step in? Thing. Please do. Yeah. I, would never, I would never say I wasn't afraid. <laughs> so I think I... Um, I think the part of the part of this is that I did at some level once things started, there was no turning back. <laughs> so I did try to kind of quell the internal angst that was going on and still do. Yeah, let's still do. Up. Yeah, I still do. <laughs> okay. So let's so see. Let's second. see. Sure. Um, PJ, can I just open the Q and A? No, we don't. We don't have questions rolling in just yet. We just sent okay. a prompt, a prompt into the audience. Okay. Uh, I saw that Elaine Ostroff had her hand up, and so um, terrific. If Elaine wants, to, Elaine, if you want to type your question into the Q and A, Valerie can moderate it for you. And there is a question here from uh, Michelle Dupree. Valerie, do you want me to read the question, or do you want to read it yourself? Uh, I got it. Um, let's start with that. So um, uh, uh, a close colleague of ours, an attorney uh, in New Haven, Connecticut, Michelle Dupre. Um, Michelle is asking, what are some of the most important disability rights issues you think we need to tackle in the next 10 years? In the next 10 years? 10 years, yeah. Uh -huh. Well, I think there are a number of them. Uh, one of them is really being able to get more of the 61 million people in the United States to acknowledge they have a disability. And I think that means that we in the movement itself have to be doing more work to reach out to people, to allow people to know who is considered someone who has a disability. Because I think many people really um, don't know uh, that they have a disability. They may know that they're having you know, if you if you, we look at what's going on with COVID right now, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and we uh, learn about the higher mortality rate of uh, people of color, Black and Latinos, and we learn talk about underlying underlying features, characteristics of diabetes and hypertension. Now, those are definitely disabilities, mm -hmm. but if people with diabetes and hypertension don't understand that they are part of our community, uh, they may not be availing themselves, one, of talking and becoming friends with other people who have similar disabilities, to be able to talk about their experiences, um, their dis discrimination that may be occurring uh, to them in employment, in education, other areas, if people know that they have certain types of disabilities. So we need to be doing more outreach. We also need to be really working and getting the media to do a, a better job of including uh, reporting on who we are as a population, the diversity of our population. It's, I believe the media can play and must be playing a more crucial role in allowing the general public to both understand that there are many of us, our lives are like others. We wish to participate in our society with others and they need to also learn about the barriers, both the physical and um, structural barriers that exist. So for me, that's a very big issue. The other is um, needing to be working um, I want to say it's a two-way street, working with national organizations and international organizations that are looking at issues around uh, human civil rights, justice-related issues, that disability truly become a part of their agenda, and that we in the disability community are also really ensuring that our public voice um, is um, in sync 
with the broader discussions that are going on about the disparities that exist, not just in our country, but around the world. I think it goes without saying that um, there are at least 1 billion disabled people in the world. What I said earlier about the need to have people come out, feel proud of who they are, recognize that discrimination is illegal. The Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities as the international uh, treaty that most of the world is working with, although we have not yet ratified. So I would say that's another very important issue. And the third aspect is looking at areas like healthcare disparities, home and community-based mm -hmm. services, mm -hmm. employment. Um, one of the issues that the disability community around the world has spoken about is speaking out against institutions. And we've spoken out against institutions for decades. And the unfortunate thing that we're looking, seeing in COVID around the world is that where there are institutions, the death rate for people, both workers and people in the institution is extraordinarily high um, because the infection spreads, people are in clusters in close communities. Now, that is one of the reasons that um, segregated housing is so bad. But the bigger issue for us really has been the ability to be living in the community, the ability to live our lives like others and not to have to change because laws and policies are not appropriately being implemented, developed or implemented. So for me in the United States, we need to really be fighting for better health care. We need to be fighting for personal assistance services, we need to be fighting for support services for people with psychosocial disabilities, people who are deaf and hard of hearing and blind and low vision and on and on to make sure that we really are able to be included. Thanks, Judy. Uh, uh, just, to, just to add a little, a little coda there, one of the things that I think is remarkable about Black Lives Matter and about COVID-19 is that we are having a public discussion in American media about mental health at a rate I don't recall we've ever had before. Um, and I think that's, you know, given the, the, the size of that population of people with disabilities, it's a, it's a critical moment to seize that attention. Uh, and make something of it. We've got lots of questions now. Um, and I think you've talked some about the newer challenges. Um, Judy, you've talked about, somebody is asking about um, when you were a young woman, what would, with what you know now, what would have helped? Um, you know. What would have helped is that I and, and the emerging disability community didn't feel alone. Yeah. Um, you know, as the women's movement um, began, disabled women were not really a part of it. Um, I was one of the 80 women to watch in Ms. Magazine, which I was very honored to be. But the bottom line is the women's movement, all of the movements are really still um, looking at, and I think being pressured by the disability communities to see us as a part of their movement. So that is one thing that if um, that, that was occurring as I was growing up would have been very valuable. The Civil Rights Act of 1964, which is the seminal piece of legislation in the United States. And we saw just the other day how the Supreme Court used the civil rights provisions in employment to, to um, stipulate that it was against the law to discriminate against someone in employment because of their um, LGBTQI status. Um, disability was not in that law. It took us between 1964 and 1990 to be able to have equivalent legislation and regulations and enforcement. So I think we have in the next 10 years, both a lot of catch up work to do um, but I do believe that we are, there is much more acknowledgement of some of the major areas of discrimination that disabled people are facing. And I'm really very excited about the growth and development of um, younger people 
within our movement. And you can, I feel that part of what has been going on um, in teenagers, people in their 20s and 30s and 40s, is they really began to benefit from Section 504, from the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, from the Americans with Disabilities Act. And although those laws are not um, yet being implemented to the degree that I would like them to be, there is much, much, much more work that's been going on. And so you see that, you know, people have gone to schools with non-disabled individuals, gotten by and large better educations. More people are going to universities, still not the same uh, percentage as non-disabled people and the dropout rate is still higher. And when we look at employment, the rates of employment before COVID, um, the rate of employment of disabled people is substantially lower than for non-disabled people. So I, I need to interject in this discussion about the next 10 years that we really need to be looking at um, the inclusion of disability as we move beyond COVID, which is gonna be going on for the next year to year and a half um, in one way and in another way much longer. Um, we have got to be central in the discussions that are happening to ensure as our societies around the world are being redesigned that disabled people in fact are able to move more into the world of work. In the United States, just this few months ago, the latest data that had come out said that 1 million disabled people had lost their jobs. You know, the um, last hired, the first fired. So I think these are critical issues because of the economic impact also that COVID is gonna have. When I talk about things like personal assistance services, that's gonna take money and how we're gonna take, how we're gonna use our financial resources um, to be able to ensure that people from all backgrounds are gonna be able to get mental health services, social workers, um, other kinds of supports that people need, it's gonna be a real challenge. Thanks, Judy. I think we're also gonna be dealing with, one of the things that as, as COVID continues to play out, we're gonna be dealing with people who are vulnerable because of pre-existing conditions, who will work remotely, who will go to school remotely while other people return to work or to school and are physically present. And how do we figure out how to not have a two-tiered system of people well, who are Also, present? not every, I mean, taking myself as an example, I just can't be at home doing all these things by myself. If I'm at school, there is a legal obligation for uh, the school to provide me with certain types of supports. Mm. Does that legal obligation carry over if I'm having to you know, um, participate in school or work at home? Thanks. Uh, I think one of the things that we're getting is a lot of young people who've been really inspired by you and by your book um, and, and starting their careers. You know, before we before we move on to the next section, um, anything, you know, thinking about that young woman who um, was bold when it when you needed to be bold, any any words of wisdom um, all these years later? And I guess we are looking at 50 years later um, for at people least. who are starting I'm out. 72. So, yeah, 50 years later. <laughs> Um, when we were um, in, in the 60s and 70s, Crip Camp, as an example, it was an opportunity for us as younger disabled people to begin, one, to acknowledge that what was happening to us as individuals was not isolated. There were people everywhere who, if they had a disability, um, were experiencing segregation, isolation, humiliation. And I think one of the big issues was uh, not feeling empowered. The ability for us to come together and begin to have discussions was very empowering. Not feeling like you're alone and sharing ideas and seeing how um, working together in creating next steps was so very important. 
So, you know, and that is something that continues regardless of age. But I really uh, believe that it's important as it's happening, you know, younger people who are um, working now on continuing to advance the movement uh, will, as they see fit, talk to older people like myself to learn about what we did and how we did things. And also that many of the issues that people are working on are really intergenerational issues. But I, I always say, don't wait for people to give you permission. If you believe that what you're doing is right, and I always wanna underscore the importance of working collaboratively and collectively. Um, if, if you're doing that, if you're, it will give you a sense of, I think, inner strength. And as you move forward, um, you'll have victories, you'll have losses, we'll have victories, we'll have losses, and at the end of the day, we, for me, I think it's very important that uh, we recognize that isms of any kind do not just occur overnight. And in my view, we're naive. If we believe that just because we've been working with people who um, want to try to be allies, that they're going to be able to become true allies overnight. We have to be breaking bread together. We have to be working together, thinking together, partying together, peeling an onion together to really <laughs> get the, uh, the real essence. Because I guess one thing that I've learned is I'm not necessarily truly transparent um, if I don't really know the people I'm talking to. I'm not necessarily going to say things that I would say to my disabled friends. And that to me is also very important to really have a group of friends. And for me, it's very important to have disabled friends who've had similar experiences to kind of bolster uh, me and each other and you know, my friends and others as we move forward. Judy, you've just um, done a nice segue into opening the next chunk of, of um, the conversation, which is really thinking about this collaborating in um, collective work. And your career from that, that early moment has really stepped fully into that commitment to create a structure that will keep those values moving forward and engage loads of people in it. And, and it starts with you know, the early development of new nonprofits. Um, and I think that's a, that's a really critical story. And it, it moves out from there to major institutions and to the development of a le legal infrastructure. But I think the, those, first, those first moves on your part of creating nonprofits that didn't exist before, I think, let's start with that. Tell us that story about why that was important. So at that time, um, what we see is there were many organizations that, and they still exist, <laughs> and I'm not being disparaging towards uh, these groups, but um, they were really at that point in time looking much more at the charitable model. Uh, and much of what was going on was looking at issues of prevention of disability and um, really going forth to the public, trying to pull people's heartstrings, give money to help this child do blah, blah, um, help this adult do blah, blah. It wasn't uh, coming forward in the, in the model of what was, was emerging in the 1950s and 60s, which was a civil rights movement for everyone else. And so we were looking and learning a lot about, and, and not necessarily in a deep way, um, we were learning through television, through the newspapers. Um, we were learning, in, in my case, in case some of my friends, by working with organizations like the Paralyzed Veterans of America, or in New York, the Eastern Paralyzed Veterans of America. Uh, we were working with these organizations 
that, you know, you had to be a nonprofit to be able to do certain things. So that's really, um, when I was involved with setting up this group called Disabled in Action in New York, um, it was a cross disability, still is, uh, a cross disability organization that was a rights-based group. And um, we looked at a myriad of issues. And I think that structure um, was very beneficial to are beginning to learn about how we could create and develop organizations that also um, could raise money, uh, learning about raising money both through the private sector grants uh, and foundations, as well as uh, money from state governments, local governments, and national governments. And that's, you know, when I left Brooklyn and went to California, to become involved with the Berkeley Center for Independent Living. Disabled in Action and CIL were similar in many ways and very different. Uh, the similarity was disabled run, community-based advocacy work. Uh, what was different is that CIL had begun to, um, did create a 501c3 as we had in New York with DIA, but it was also looking at um, providing certain kinds of services, helping people find places to live, it was not a residential program. Um, applying for money from the city to be able to build ramps and make door, doors wider, put bars in, modify kitchens, um, to be able to help people uh, look for people who could work in their homes and in their communities, on and on. So we were really branching out and uh, moving just beyond advocacy, but looking at what did we need as disabled individuals with more significant disabilities in order to really be able to participate in the process. Because one of the reasons we had not really been participating in the process is lack of accessible transportation. If you couldn't drive, you couldn't get places. If you couldn't get assistance to help you up out of bed, to get dressed and to be able, in some cases, to come with you to the meetings, to be able to go to the bathroom, all of those things. If we didn't have that, we couldn't really play the leadership role that we wanted. So I think one of the important parts of the Centers for Independent Living in the United States and now around the world is one of the reasons why the voices of disabled people are being unleashed is because we are uh, in a much more active way driving the agenda that really is enabling people with significant disabilities who were in the past being spoken about and for who are now speaking up for ourselves. And the alliances with other organizations, if you both in the book and in the film, um, you'll see, and I think, you know, very graphically in the film, um, that the reason why the 504 demonstrations in 1977 were so successful, but we were fighting to get a set of regulations signed um, after a four year process of negotiation um, was because we were working both in the Bay Area, but the American Coalition of Citizens with Disabilities in Washington and groups around the country we're also working with civil rights organizations, with women's groups, uh, with e legal aid um, and other uh, programs that were providing legal services for uh, minority individuals, with religious leaders that were progressive. Um, that consortia, as a loose-knit consortia, was critical. And we've seen as that grows, and it's still in no way where it needs to be. But as it's been growing over the last 40, 50 years, that's also when I think we uh, not only strengthen our movement, we strengthen uh, human rights and movements for justice. We strengthen it in its entirety. And also, as I was saying earlier, the ability to have a greater representation of voices um, from within the disability community 
allows us to learn more effectively how we can be providing appropriate support and assistance for kids who need to be getting services under the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, for families who don't have financial resources to be able to go out and get a lawyer, to get make sure that those families are learning about the rights of their children and how they can be advocating. So I think we've done an amazing amount of work in saying that the problems are still very significant. Judy, one of the things that you've done um, so impressively in addition to creating nonprofits that have created a national infrastructure and have really changed the way people think about how work gets done um, is, to, is to be part of huge institutions. You know, originally in the, the Department of Education, uh, the senior person with a disability in the Department of Education, um, and, and years later in, in the Obama administration in the State Department. Um, and then the, in the private sector, major institutions of the World Bank and the Ford Foundation. I mean, you've played in some pretty big ponds. Um, talk to us about that. Talk to us about what those represent to you in terms of critical commitments. So I have to say, when I was um, offered a position as an assistant secretary at the Department of Education, and I reflect on this in the book, um, I was very nervous about that. I was nervous about it for quite a number of reasons. Anybody looking to take that kind of a job, whether they have a disability or not, there's a huge amount of responsibility. And your normal life basically is gone for the period of time that you work in any of these jobs. Um, but one of the other big issues for me was um, I had worked for about 20 years, both with the Center for Independent Living in Berkeley and then done volunteer work with the National Council on Independent Living, been involved with, um, I was a co-founder of the World Institute on Disability. I very much was immersed in the disability world. I felt comfortable um, in working with disabled people and non-disabled people who were working within our organizations and really um, got, in most cases, what it was that we were trying to do. I knew that when I would start working at the Department of Education, although there was an office, we had 400 staff, uh, we had a, at that point, about a $10 billion budget, um, that I could stay just working within the Office of Special Education and Rehabilitative Services, or I could really look at um, not only ensuring that OSERS was running effectively, but to me, in order to run effectively, we had to be able to work with the various offices within the Department of Education. So we had to be working effectively with the bilingual office. We had to be working effectively with the vocational education office. We had to be working with the higher ed office, with research, on and on. And I knew that there would be some people that would be interested and others that just would kind of try to placate, you know, you. And so I would say both in my job at the Department of Education and at the World Bank and at the State Department, one of the big issues that we were always working on was why should issues affecting disabled people be integrated into the broader agenda? What did people need to learn? How were people gonna be held accountable? Because one of the big issues is, in all of these types of institutions, universities are by and large still not appropriately educating people who are going to have responsibility in a myriad of types of jobs, whether it's human rights or architecture or healthcare or transportation. Uh, there is still not a lot that people are being taught, nor our managers and leadership of many organizations really understand how understanding how you build in that accountability. Mm -hmm. So really, um, anyone in these types of jobs, um, if one has a vision of really um, ensuring that disability is more integrated 
needs to recognize that there are going to be some people that really are interested in learning and doing something about it. There are others that are not sure and there are others that don't want to do it. My feeling all along has been, especially in these big institutions, I'm not going to start by dealing with people who don't want to do it. I'm going to start doing this work with the leadership of the organizations, the heads of the organizations, beginning to talk more about disability and holding their people under them more accountable because if people see the senior leadership speaking about this issue, asking for information on disability as it pertains to their programs, um, that's very important. And so that's really a message that I, I give to people is that really look at what the problems are, what solutions are. There's some very good work that's going on within many companies where they are trying and moving forward. But I think, again, I'm sure most people would agree that there's a lot more that needs to be done. We need to learn about what's working. Groups like um, Disability In, the National Organization on Disability in Employment are like two organizations that have been doing work on issues of inclusive employment for many years now. They're a good source to look at models that are working effectively. Um, but I think that's been, that was really one of my challenges all along the way, when to push, how hard to push, um, how to not get people to kind of be closing their door because, oh, here comes Judy, she's going to be, really? Um, so having to, you know, build relationships where people can believe that what you're saying is true and that they are responsible for helping as leaders in the organizations and as regular, you know, implementers, um, that we have a collective responsibility. Um, thank you, Judy. Um, and before we get to the questions, just, just, just take a minute to talk about your role um, at the State Department when you really had the whole world um, that you could, you know, you could, you could play this out and you could talk about accountability and structures. So at the State Department, you know, it was one dealing within the department itself, <laughs> looking at, um, so we were uh, in the Democracy, Human Rights and Labor Office. And disability, it, it, the position that I held was the first, the first time a position like this had existed. We had a small staff, but everybody who worked in our little unit had the same philosophy. So I would say we worked and play well with, played well with others. And we also saw our responsibility to look at learning about the institution, what some of the major issues were, for example, in the DRL office, one of them being um, the Congress has required that the Department of State issue human rights reports every year. Um, disability is in the requirement, but was not being seriously looked at. And people were at the country level for the embassy, US embassies, didn't really, not always, but by and large, didn't really have contacts with disabled people in their communities. They were more likely to be speaking to the traditional charities uh, where they may or may not have gotten the right information, depending on the country. Um, government involvement in some of those organizations was not likely to allow you to get the real stories from the disabled people's perspective. So, you know, taking on as one of our first objectives, the human rights reports, what we could be doing to help train the uh, gatherers of information and the writers for the human rights report so that the language in there on disability would be um, more accurate, um, would be reflective in a more similar way to the other sections that were being written. 
um, that it wasn't acceptable to say that country X didn't want to educate disabled kids, so they sent them to country Y. That was not something that was good to have in the report. What we needed in the report was what was being done that country X started educating disabled kids. Um, the first year I was there, I traveled um, pretty extensively. We visited, I don't know, four or five countries in a short period of time. And that was also a great learning experience because um, my view was that in planning the trip, the ambassador needed to want me to be coming there. Uh, there needed to be a team of people that was devoted to, I don't mean 100%, but a portion of their time uh, was going to be devoted to um, prepping for those trips. And prepping for me was one, prepping for the substance, and two, logistics. Something that, of course, they had no idea about. Um, I never didn't go to a country because of accessibility issues. We would figure it out, but it really did mean that was a lot of hands-on. People had to go out to hotels. They had to look at things. They had to transportation. They had to do things that they never had to do before. And, you know, little things like getting ramps so that, um, you know, they could use one of the trucks that the embassy or somebody else had so I could get in and out of a truck to be able to travel around and uh, on and on. But I would say that all of these visits were really, really productive because the ambassadors or the deputy ambassadors um, and the staff also got to meet the disability community because we always had a meeting that was either chaired and more cases than not was chaired by the ambassador where we invited disability organizations to come in, in many cases for the first time and really have discussions. Um, we would do press outreach and I would visit programs, uh, meet disabled individuals, have various discussions. And the fact that I was and am a disabled person using a motorized chair and I always, I never travel in a manual wheelchair um, because I'm very uncomfortable and I want people to see that, you know, what is possible and um, may be difficult. It may not be happening tomorrow, but things that are possible. So, and I think, you know, when I worked at the World Bank, we also uh, were able because of uh, President Wilkinson to get money that enabled all of the regional offices to hire at a minimum a consultant. And uh, most of the consultants that were hired were disabled individuals. So people like Catalina DeVondis, um, who's now the special advisor on uh, disability at the UN. Um, Catalina came in as a consultant in the World Bank in the Latin America region. Uh, Rosangela Berman Beeler came in first. Rosangela is now the lead person at the United at, um, UNICEF on disability. Uh, Charlotte McLean and Clapo was another person that we brought in. And Charlotte is now the lead person at the World Bank um, on disability. So, you know, we were able to build things, bring more disabled people in were out there who were doing disability international work, but had not yet been able to get into these institutions where they could have influence. So that's another, I think, really um, important part of the work that we all have been doing is really, you know, if you're the first woman coming into an organization, the first black woman coming into an organization, whatever it is, it's pretty lonely and isolating. Looking at what you can do to bring more people um, from communities that are not represented, uh, the more you get to really have honest and open discussions about what the real problems are and what the real solutions are, as opposed to kind of saying a few things and make, making people feel good. And I think really at the World Bank, one thing that I feel really proud about is some people really, really did engage in many ways and uh, really um, learned uh, by like, there's a woman named Susan O'Sullivan 
who's just retiring from the State Department, who headed up the um, uh, Asia section in the Human Rights Office at State DRL. And sh we traveled together a lot. We traveled to China a number of times. We traveled to Vietnam and to Korea. It was the first time that she'd ever been in the bowel of the beast, so to speak, you know, learning about an airline refusing me or trying to refuse me in Vietnam to get on a plane to go to China because of the batteries in my wheelchair. Uh, people learned in a much deeper way about the kinds of barriers that we face, issue of sign language interpreters, treatment of people with intellectual disabilities or mental health disabilities, whatever it may be. And it made and makes people who really are um, fighters for human and civil rights and justice learn in a way that they can understand more about what, what changes they need to make in their leadership. Thank you, Judy. Let's open it up for questions. Do we have any questions? Um, I'm looking at, um, I think I'm looking at, an, let's see, do we have new questions, PJ? Can you just? Um, yeah, there's a, there's a, there, do you, if you pull up the Q&A, Valerie, there's about, mm -hmm. there's, a, there's a solid queue of about 35 questions in there. Okay, so, okay. So there's um, one here. I think that- Christina Cortez. I'm 27, I have CP and a wheelchair user. I read the book, an audio book, the Watch Crip Camp. I'm an author, an activist, a blogger. I wrote a review of the book. Um, and a question I have is what was writing the book like? Um, so I wrote with this woman named Kristen Joyner. Her role was she, uh, we would talk and she would write and I would read and we would rewrite. Um, she had to do research and get a better understanding because as a non-disabled person, there were many things she didn't understand, even though she's a feminist and had done work in other areas. So it's a long process. It took a number of years for us to be able to bring the book forward. I would also say that it also forced me in working. I mean, I chose to have someone uh, write with because I don't feel secure enough in my writing. So it also forced me to be more forthright and honest as we were moving forward if I didn't if I didn't agree with the way things had been written, if they didn't really have the nuances that I felt were important, we had to kind of duke it out. But I think we've learned to do that more effectively. Other I'm um, just checking. I, I, we're now getting a, a lot of them that are coming in. I'm just seeing now. Give me a second, Judy. Um, Somebody is asking about the impetus to produce Crip Camp, and you may not have been the catalyst for that, but you sure had a lot of good footage. Uh, what was the catalyst for that? The catalyst for the film was uh, Jimmy Lebrecht. So the... the uh, the moderator throughout the film, and Jimmy also is one of the directors. Mm -hmm. So you see Jimmy in the very beginning of the film, he's the really handsome, cute dude, um, <laughs> rolling himself down the wheelchair, in his wheelchair down the ramp. Um, Jimmy went on as, if, you, if you've seen the film, Jimmy went on to become a sound engineer, a, a prominent sound engineer. And uh, he decided a number of years ago that he wanted to begin to do more work that was representative of disability issues. So it was his initial idea to try to put together a documentary, which ultimately has become Crip Camp. Nicole Noonan, who um, is the other director, he and Nicole had worked together for a good number of years. He, as um, her sound engineer, she had produced a number of documentaries, award-winning documentaries. And so, you know, they had been working together. And then Sarah Boulder, um, who also um, comes from the field, who happens to be married to Jimmy, um, the three of them really came together um, in beginning to 
design uh, what it was they were interested in producing. And I got brought in pretty early on to uh, just have basic discussions with them about whether or not this seemed to be something that would be important to do and how to do it. And was you know very honored and fortunate that I um, am significantly in the film. I think also, excuse me, the other part about this film is the breadth of the voices of people that are brought into the film. And so there really was uh, a successful effort made at bringing people in with different experiences, different types of disabilities, and uh, showing how we both uh, learned from each other at camp and then had similar visions for what we wanted to achieve and continue to move forward uh, in advancing the movement, creating. I mean, I never want to say exactly creating because there have been other aspects of the movement before, but I think really um, not just through Camp Jeanette, but across the United States, there were emerging groups from college campuses at the Centers for Independent Living uh, began to emerge. Ed Roberts, who was one of the founders of the Berkeley CIL, became the uh, director for the Department of Rehabilitation in California. He was able to use federal money to set up 10 Centers for Independent Living in California before the federal government had uh, passed legislation and put funding into, excuse me, the um, establishment of 10 centers for independent living around the United States. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I've got a, a, a number, many, many questions, um, more than we um, will we'll, we'll get to. We can certainly, can, we can share these with Judy and see if we can come up with some answers for some of the questions. Um, one person is asking, and this is an anonymous attendee, Judy's saying that illnesses such as um, hypertension and diabetes, socioeconomic and racial injustice, LGBTQ, um, I don't think you're saying that those are that, that LGBTQ is a disability, though there's certainly an overlap with many people with disabilities are LGBTQ, um, then aren't we all disabled in some way, is the question. So we all face the prospect of acquiring a temporary or permanent disability. And well, I have a primary disability of polio. I've also had cancer a number of times. And other, so it's acquiring a, a disability, it's acquiring multiple disabilities. I would say that um, I don't consider everyone to be a disabled person. I would like it to be that everyone with a disability or not, is learning and understanding the disability experience and what role we can be playing, not only in creating a society where all people are respected and equal, I think in the non-disability community, um, thank you for your question, because in the non-disability community, what I still don't see enough and I think Valerie can really attest to this, is non-disabled people in their 20s, 30s, and 40s are not really engaged in the discussion, for example, around planning of our communities. The fact that housing is still regularly being built that is inaccessible. So if you buy a place when you're 20 years old with a stairway to heaven, um, and you wanna <laughs> live in your place until you're 75 or 80, that ain't going to happen in most cases. And why are we not really looking, um, why are you not looking at yourself? And I don't mean you who asked the question, but why are non-disabled people avoiding the issue of what they want to be, what they want their lives to be in the future, where they may, wait, they may well be acquiring, you know, different forms of disability that may be mild to moderate to significant. So um, you can call yourself an ally, but if you're not experiencing many of these things because you don't have a disability, then please be an ally. You don't need to take on the label of disability because I think um, it's like if you're not a black person, 
taking on the label of black or Latino or Asian or whatever um, is not really welcome. People want to know that we understand that we can be supportive and that we can take their leadership. And I think that's really one of the critical issues in the disability community. When I was talking earlier about what was happening before the disability rights movement really was emerging in the 60s and 70s and forward, those of us with disabilities that were speaking up and out about, we need to have organizations run by disabled people, just like women run women's organizations and men are not running women's organizations. Why is it that the organizations on disability are all being run by non-disabled people? Um, that model has to change. And I think that's still something that many disabled people feel very strong mm -hmm. about. We have to be the influencers, the primary drivers. Um, just, a, just a couple of points here, Judy. Uh, one, of the, one of the phrases that was a, a sort of transformational moment at the Helen Hamlin Center at the Royal College of Art was to, to reframe things for design students as designing for our future selves. Thank you. <laughs> Getting people and to I know think you've that done way. that, which is, and, and I think that's one of the reasons why I really loved working with Valerie, you know, because she very much embodies the vision of the future for all, the concept around universal design and allowing people to see how it is relevant in their life today. Judy, the, the, the last chunk of time is to really move to, and we apologize for not getting to everybody's questions, but um, I think Judy's responded to, you know, a, a, <clears throat> some of the flavor of the questions at least. Um, <clears throat> We cannot ignore that this moment in time in America, in particular, though it's happening all over the world, is like no other in terms of the, um, the size of a movement uh, and a level of activism that we have not seen. You and I were around in the, in, the, in the 60s and 70s. We know what that looked like, and we certainly didn't see global uh, marches every day of the week. We certainly didn't see small towns in Montana mounting <coughs> marches. <coughs> It's an extraordinary crisis and an extraordinary moment of opportunity. And I think you have a lot to say to, to this moment, partly because of the boldness of 1977, of basically not being willing to take no for an answer, of wringing your hands and complaining, but of actually taking bold, uh, one might say illegal action, <clears throat> to take over a federal office. Um, and to do that, not casually, but to do that for how many days? 27. <laughs> that is, uh, that, that's a landmark of bold activism. And I think that, that there is an important opportunity for us to really think about diversity, about civil and human rights at the core of all of this. It, it, it is a through line from what you were doing in 1977 and certainly to what happened in the, in the 60s and <clears throat> around civil rights. Is, there are multiple through lines here, but I think we have an opportunity for a convergence, a convergence here in which may be a moment of opportunity that is maybe bigger than we've had before because of the cross the, the cross-sectionality of what we're seeing, that, that, it's, that it's coming together. God knows we have no guarantee it will work. But I think your choice as a person who had, you know, there was no precedent for what you did, that, you know, that, that's hadn't been done before. Um, and I think it's, it's important to be reminded of, of your thinking about that, of what it's like to take that kind of risk, to put yourself fully in harm's way, really, because of something you believe in so deeply and are convinced that absent that work, critical things will not happen. Can you talk about that and, and tie it to today? So um, I would say that what enabled the action in 77 to happen was the fact that disabled people around the country and organizations like the American Coalition of Citizens with Disabilities, one of the primary reasons why ACCB had been formed in 1975 uh, was to deal with um, implementation of Title V of the Rehab Act 
which included 504. So there really was a groundswell from disabled people around the country uh, who believed that when the Nixon Ford administration refused to sign the regulations um, for 504 and the Carter administration came in and had promised us that they would sign these regulations. And when they began to backtrack on what they said, I think you know we felt at that very moment that if we did not do anything and everything possible to get those regulations signed, that we would lose, that they would eventually sign some regulations, but that the influence of the lobbyists in higher education and healthcare, et cetera, would win. And we were not going to do that. I think it was a moment in time when there were enough of us who really believed that we had done everything that we possibly could have done to play in the system of the development of regulations, um, the commenting on draft regulations, the participating in discussions around compromising on the regulations that we had reached our very bottom and we're not going to do that anymore. So I think, you know, when you look at the film and when you read the book, you know, you'll see people talking about um, the decision to stay overnight. It really was another whole discussion, but there was nothing that was really planned for us to stay overnight. There were a couple of us who had said, I had talked to Kitty and I said, I think maybe we need to be thinking about not leaving the building. And, you know, we had spoken to a couple other people, but it was just a minimal, minimal number of people that we had even, we hadn't planned anything, right? It was thinking about. And then when we had this meeting with them, they were, they, Health Education and Welfare, the regional director, were so unprepared when we had had meetings with people from our team and their team fully explaining what we wanted to do. We wanted a discussion to learn about what was really happening. And when the ACCD group in Washington um, had gone into their meeting and HEW knew out of the federal level what the purpose, they knew we were having demonstrations. The demonstrations were not a surprise. Um, it, was, it was known by the HEW crowd that there would be demonstrations in at least nine areas. We felt when, I can just now speak to the San Francisco Bay Area crowd, we felt completely ignored and dismissed. The fact that the regional director had no idea of what 504 was. When we asked that his staff come in, because I had just worked in the Senate for a year and a half, and all I could think of is the briefing memo to this guy didn't get there because we were always writing briefing mem memos for the senator. And if you knew he was having a meeting with people like us and he didn't get the briefing memo, you'd invite the staff in. So, you know, we demanded bring your staff in and they didn't know anything about it. So it was really, um, we just said we can't leave. And we built on it as we were there. Um, and someone asked a question about Olmstead. <laughs> Hi, Michael. And um, uh, what do we see as promises kept or denied um, around Olmstead and the ADA? You know, I think, um, and 504, et cetera. As I said earlier, these changes don't happen overnight. And I would say that when the Obama administration um, was in that they had some very committed people working in the Department of Justice and other agencies that were really working and pushing states to address issues around implementation of Olmstead in uh, holding states accountable, um, in putting them under orders of correction, on closing down institutions. Um, and I think that's all in the right direction I don't think we've had as much of that going on um, in this administration because this administration 
I'm sure this will be a surprise to everybody, really doesn't give a shit about us and has demonstrated that in many, many ways, not even having a person in the White House who even is pretending to be their representative on disability. So I think Olmstead is a, very, a really important case. Um, and it also speaks to something that we were talking about earlier, what needs to be happening over the next 10 years. We need, and I would say sooner, you know, money follows the person, keeping people out of institutions, uh, ensuring that poor people have access to funding so that they can rent places and potentially buy places, that people can get the kinds of supports they need in the community, not in uh, congregate living settings, but being able to live in an apartment by themselves or choose one or two roommates. That's what I think. And I think Olmsted is definitely um, forcing us to move in that direction of a discussion. Judy, one of the great stories out of the 1977 event when you sat in at HEW is um, the call to the Black Panthers um, and their response <clears throat> to actually be the providers of meals <coughs> for everyone who was sitting in. And why did they do it? They didn't have much money either. Um, they did talk it. Talk about that. They did it because one of their members had a disability. Right. right. Brad Lomax, who's in the film yeah. at MS. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was Brad that was able to, well, because he was a member. Yeah. Um, and he was able to, um, you know, demonstrate this was something that uh, the Black Panthers were supporting. They understood the issue of discrimination that people were facing. They understood the importance of what we were trying to do. There were others that also, you know, we had um, Panthers provide meals, which was obviously very critical. Uh, there were many other organizations that also provided support, including the State Department of Health that sent mattresses down. The <laughs> Jerry Brown, Governor Jerry Brown administration sent mattresses down so people didn't have to sleep on the floor. You know, people from Glide Memorial Church and, other, and the labor unions. Uh, we never would have been able to go back to wash from Washington, sorry, from California to Washington and back if it wasn't for the machinist union and others who put money into being able to have people fly back and forth, um, as well as renting a van that the union members drove and took us every place when we were in DC. So it was um, a very important time where you really could see that I think in some way what's happening now that when we were able to so graphically explain the problems that disabled and non-disabled people really understood what we were saying, which was these regulations had to be signed as they were now. Thank you, Judy. Um, I, and I think just to, just to take a second to talk about regulations, because one of the things that somebody had asked questions about or about architecture, and one of the things that is a sad byproduct 30 years after the passage of the ADA um, is that many people only know the standards and they don't know the regulations. Um, they're just, the regulations are often forgotten, you know, where you define who is a person with rights under this, under this law. Um, and, and we're still dealing with that, that that notion of equal access to program services and activities is really the heart of that, that importance of regulations. Um, what does that mean today? How do we think about that? You know, it just in terms of getting to the practical, getting to what really matters um, is, is, is for people to understand that, that, you know, standards are one thing, but they're over here and they were, they were written for, you know, a group of people at a given moment in time, but the regulations need to be looked at as a way to frame your responsibilities uh, for action today. I think we have to also remember that many people today in the disability community and others don't even know what ADA is. Um, they weren't around when it was developed. Um, they may know about it because they're part of an organization that deals with this. But I would say 
many people, and when you think that in the area of disability, most people acquire their disabilities as they're getting older, they don't see themselves as having a disability. Uh, if they're not meeting with like a healthcare provider, who may be the first people that they're involved with. Um, and the healthcare provider doesn't say anything about, oh, by the way, there is this law called the Americans with Disabilities Act. It's a means of protection and all their other laws that are out there. Why would somebody know? So I think um, maybe, you know, with the next administration, um, God willing, it will not be a repeat of this administration. Um, one of the things that needs to be done is really more proactively allowing people to understand what the laws are that are out there, what the regulations are, um, allow us to look at effective implementation and also not necessarily be looking at amending the law, uh, but looking at strengthening regulations, strengthening knowledge, um, allowing people millions of people who benefit from this law. And I'm, now I'm talking about not just disabled people, but I think, you know, in looking at the average person who really, in many ways, wants to do the right thing, understanding, you know, what is required, and in some cases, what isn't required. Mm. But I'm just, you know, when we look right now at what's going on with COVID and the situation around masks, and whether people can wear masks or not wear masks. And if you can't wear a mask, how do you get what you need? And what responsibility does you know, a store owner, a Walmart or whomever have to help ensure that you can be safe um, and also that the customers and workers can be safe? How can you get what you need? Um, and understanding what the law requires and doesn't require. Um, I think, you know, the 30th anniversary is an opportunity for how do we uh, reinvigorate people's um, commitment to um, knowledge of what the law is, what other laws we need, because ADA is an anti-discrimination law. It is not, for example, a home and community-based services law, never was intended to be. So I think it needs a, uh, a refresher a way of helping to ensure, you know, that universities understand what they should be teaching, that in licensing exams, there needs to be questions on um, ADA related issues and potentially state laws, but no questions at all is not acceptable. Um, and I think those are some of the fundamental issues we still need to address. And just to, just to add to that a little bit, one of the things in, in our work on the changing reality of disability in America, one of the institutional realities of disability today is our correction system and the prevalence of people with disabilities in those systems and the predictable lack of rights and responsibilities uh, understood in that context, which fall particularly hard on people of color. Well, I think um, it's a great example and it was something that um, when I worked in the Clinton administration, we were definitely um, fighting for because uh, when the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act came up for reauthorization in the 1970s, there was an attempt by the Republicans to allow kids with disabilities to be expelled from school. Mm -hmm. And um, we were able to, I would say we didn't completely win on this, but we did um, fight back the issue of expulsion so that if a kid had violated a law, that was one thing. If they would be prosecuted because they violated a law, that would be one thing. But their disability should not be a cause for them. You know, if they had an emotional disability, they needed services. And the, the way to address it was not to expel the child, nor to put the child in a juvenile facility or the youth. Mm -hmm. um, I think, you know, when the Black Lives Matter uh, movement is looking at changes in policing, you know, one of the big issues is we need to ensure now when looking at kids who are from early childhood, you know, primary, secondary school, are these kids getting the services that they need 
at an appropriate time to help ensure that they can be successful in school, that they're not the dropout rates. When you look at the kids who are in uh, juvenile facilities who have disabilities, uh, some of them which were identified before they uh, wound up getting arrested and going into juvenile facilities were not getting the services they needed. When, you would, when I would speak to special ed teachers in juvenile facilities, they would regularly talk about, I would ask the kids, when did you stop going to school? They would say 14. The teachers would privately say, no, it wasn't 14, it was 10. Because mm -hmm. at the age of 10, the kids were no longer going to school every day. They would be dropping out one or two days. Um, those kids uh, may well have needed special ed services in an inclusive setting, getting modifications to the curricula that they would be able to learn according to their ability to learn. Um, a lot of that hasn't been happening. And because they are, as you said, in they're significantly poorer in many cases. Their schools are underfunded. It's an issue for me about how we have not been supporting public education as we need to, how we have not been investing in teacher training and how we have not been investing in ensuring that parents of kids with disabilities understand what their rights are under the law. There are parent training information centers, about 100 in the country, but given that there are so many millions of kids with disabilities um, who are being served under the IDEA, clearly an insufficient amount of money that ensures that families can understand what their rights are for their children under the law, which I think would keep kids in school, get kids services, keep them out of juvenile facilities. And really when we look at police, police reform, one of the big issues has to be with ensuring that the appropriate services are being provided in the community, that we're not expecting the police to do things that they shouldn't be expected to do, that they're not trained to do, and in many cases do not want to be doing because they know they don't have the qualifications. Judy, in this extraordinary moment of activism, are you hopeful? Yes, I'm, I'm hopeful because um, I believe that the movement, our movement and movements in general are really expanding. I think the voices of uh, disabled individuals from all or from many uh, corners of the community are speaking up. I would say that um, disabled people who are older who are acquiring their disabilities um, in part because of age are not yet really a part of the movement. I think they, may, they maybe were somewhat earlier on. I think groups like the Grey Panthers and Maggie Kuhn, who was <laughs> one of the founders of the Grey Panthers, she was very much aligned with um, work that we were doing. I, I would say that definitely the younger community is definitely uh, really advancing and the diversity is really coming forward. But I would say the middle-aged group and the older group of people still uh, need to be uh, much more um, engaged. And, and also, you know, as an older disabled person now, because um, I'm 72 and a half tomorrow. <laughs> oh my tomorrow. gosh. Tomorrow, I'm 72 and a half. Oh, yeah. um, you know, groups like AARP, they're not really representing the voices of disabled people. Um, they are doing more work in this area, but I would say they really need to be challenged because, you know, people want to be living in the community and they need to be taking on some of the issues which allow people to see those of us with disabilities in a very public way, um, seeing, you know, the need for engagement in public policy, in the development and implementation of laws, and um, they're not there yet. And yeah. since they're the largest group, it's not that they're not doing things here and there, they're not participating, you may well be 
you know, working with them on some things, but their voice is so large that if they really weighed in, it would make a big difference. Thank you. Ready to listen to some questions. I think we've got some questions that have come in. Um, let me just see what we have here. Um, uh, one of the things that, that I think is, um, this, is a, this is a particular favorite concept of mine and I'm going to um, acknowledge Shauna Glover, um, who's asking the first step for persons with disabilities and their allies is to infiltrate the system locally, that infiltration model. Um, and I think you're a great example of the effectiveness of an infiltration model, as you've described. Um, by that, I mean, what would be the best way to educate our community, governments, organizations, and build rapport for those to see the value of inclusion and change without seeing us as threats to the current system? So I think um, there are many local organizations like CILs and others that are engaging with their local governments, whether it's the city government or the county government. Um, and for me, um, that is very important. You know, I'm sitting here thinking about when I was in New York, when I was in Berkeley, now in Washington, D.C. Um, in Berkeley, you know, we, we the CIL, really saw it as imperative to um, ensure, because we we're trying to get funding, right? We got money from the city um, for CDBG, for CETA, for these different programs that previously had not included disability in their, uh, in their charge. And um, we needed you know, in a very simplistic way, uh, members that get elected to whatever their position need to believe that if they are not representing um, issues that we consider to be important, that we are a voting community and that they will not be able to count our votes. Now, that's a big thing being said, um, but it really does mean, as the questioner said, we have got to be engaged. We've got to be engaged in voter registration. I believe we need to be engaged in uh, meet the candidates. I think we need to be engaged in demanding that when uh, candidates have position papers of whatever type, that they um, are including disability issues and that they're working with uh, people in the community to ensure that what's being reflected, um, what the community believes is being uh, expressed is also being reflected in uh, what candidates are agreeing to do. Um, and to the extent that that isn't happening, we need to make it known that we will not be supporting those candidates. Now, organizations, nonprofits, cannot come out endorsing or opposing candidates. But nonprofit organizations are definitely able to um, send questionnaires around to all candidates, take their responses, hold a meeting, enable people to talk to people from the different political parties um, and make up their own mind. And then there are organizations that are like PACs that can do more. Um, the Biden campaign, of which I'm involved, um, is actively engaging the disability community, um, as has been the tradition with the Obama administration, with the Clinton administration, and with all the candidates that were running uh, to be the nominee this year. So I, I agree that we have to be fully engaged and I think this in some way also relates to a point that you were just asking if you, or making a comment about a few minutes ago, which was um, uh, engagement with local politics. Close the door all the way. Uh -uh. Um, and that is, we need to help people understand what, how our government runs. I am firmly convinced that for example, people do not understand 
what responsibilities of the U.S. Senate are. They don't understand the role of a federal judge. They don't understand the role of a state mm -hmm. judge, of a municipal judge. And since some of the work that we do results in needing to take cases to court, there have been 130 judges that have been appointed in the last three years, many of whom are likely not to be our allies. And if we don't understand that our vote matters when we're voting for a congressional person or a Senate person or state or local, and we don't understand what those positions do, then we're, we're opting out. And so I would say that one thing, in addition to registering people to vote, we really need to have people get basic 101. They're not necessarily getting it in school. Um, I feel hopeful because we are seeing, you know, groups like the American Association of People with Disabilities, the Rev Up program and others that are holding virtual convenings to allow people to learn how to participate. But this is something that we need to be doing a lot more of. And I just want to get back to a question that you had raised earlier. I, I want to make it clear that hypertension and diabetes are disabilities. Poverty and race are not disabilities, nor is it being from the LGBTQ community mean that you have a disability. But uh, individuals who have HIV um, are all individuals with disabilities. And so there is a disproportionate number of people who are poor who have disabilities, but poverty is not a disability, nor is being Black or Latino or Jewish or Native American or whatever, um, that is not a disability. Um, one of the things that uh, we've talked to, to you about, Judy, is the, um, is the work that we're doing now um, to really bring to the conversation for the 30th anniversary of the ADA, the changing reality of disability in America. And it has changed fundamentally over the years. Um, you know, the youngest person in America who had polio is 66 this year. Um, uh, the youngest? Yeah. Actually, that's probably not true. And the reason really? I'm saying that, yeah. I mean, I've met people- In the US? In the US. Well, I've oh. met people in the US who had polio from Afghanistan. Oh, okay. India, yes, right, right. That would be so true. There are definitely people yeah. in the U.S. in their 30s and 40s who had okay. polio. They didn't. They didn't uh, get polio in the U.S., but they're uh, survivors living in the U.S. Okay, stand corrected. Uh, but I think that we all are aware that the, the the characteristic reasons for disability have changed over time and that we're looking at a set of conditions today that people don't understand. I mean, this issue of who is a person with a disability has become more confusing. It is the non-apparent condition that predominates today. And I think people need to understand that those are still people with disabilities and what does it mean? And I think part of where we've, we've come in this critical year is this exposure of the relationship between um, poverty and poor health care that are that can be makers of disability. I mean, I think we look at Flint, Michigan, and we have three times the number of children with learning disabilities. We look at the, the remarkable prevalence of heart disease and um, in, in all all kinds of chronic conditions in the poorest of our communities. We look at concentrations of people with disabilities in the world of people who are homeless. Um, <laughs> Jorge, hello. Hello, how are you doing? <laughs> My computer is in our foyer. That's all right. We don't have a separate room. <laughs> um, uh, Jorge is Judy's husband who um, has, a, has a brief moment in the book, but gosh, it's a good moment. <laughs> uh, but I think it's, it's really important that we educate people that, that, that is changing and that um, we, need to, we need to talk about it. We need to talk about some of the aspects that are simply being lost. Um, we need to talk about the, 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 rea the lived reality of disability in 2020 and how important it is that we draw a line between, between the experience of the earliest um, advocates and allies and visionaries like yourself to where we are today. And how do we really, how do we knit all this together? 
to make a no, more think, just world? I, I think um, invisible disabilities have been around a long time. Those invisible disabilities didn't necessarily become as apparent as they are today. When you think about learning disabilities, for example, um, people who had difficulty reading um, may well have been very productive in their communities, getting all kinds of jobs where reading wasn't essential. As we've been seeing the world of work changing um, and where reading and mechanical knowledge and scientific knowledge, I, mean, I remember you know, being told by someone, well, driving a truck used to be a job that many people could do, but now because of all the computerization of trucks and other things, you need a higher level of skills. And so if you have not been really identifying people who, are having, who have disabilities that are now impacting their lives because they're not getting the services and training that they need, that becomes an issue. I think people with mental health uh, disabilities, it's not that mental health disabilities haven't existed for a long time. I think there are new causes that you know, more people are, are experiencing mental health disabilities. Um, and I think also um, there's a more active community of people who have psychosocial disabilities themselves which did not exist previously. And people are demanding from their communities that um, people are being able to get the support that they need. So yes, you know, there are definitely certain disabilities that are going up in numbers. Um, and there are also, in my view, disabilities that are becoming more prominent because as our systems evolve, um, people are needing training and other kinds of support that 30, 40 years ago, they maybe didn't need. So it is really a changing world. And in that changing world, as you're saying, we need to not look at disabilities as something that's a negative at all, mm -hmm. but we're looking at disability mm -hmm. as something which enables us to look at you know, what are we able to do? What are we not able to do? What kinds of accommodations do we need? What interventions? You know, so for me, yes, I can't walk, but I deal with that with the ramp. I deal with that with accessible bathrooms. If you're deaf, you deal with that with sign language interpreters with appropriate technology, with appropriate uh, teaching instruction for an immigrant who comes with their first language. If they're deaf, their first language may not have been even a sign language. So, you know, you're needing to really dig more deeply into helping ensure that that individual is going to both be able to develop language and be able to get the tools that they need to move forward and be productive. It speaks more than ever about the importance of us as disabled individuals understanding our community more deeply, mm -hmm. uh, what are the causes of disability. And I think one of the points that you're making here is the weakness of our public health system. So it's, um, if someone has diabetes or hypertension, are they able to get the medications that they need so that their diabetes is under control, that the hypertension is under control, that the diabetes or hypertension doesn't result in them not being able to work because they're not getting um, on and on. So I think COVID um, over the next number of years will hopefully really enable people to see the weaknesses in our country. And I guess one thing that I also feel is really important, we do not understand clearly enough the legitimate strengths that we have in this country and weaknesses. And when I talk about weaknesses, I talk about the failure to have a system where every person living in this country has the right to healthcare. Mm -hmm. uh, have the right to health care, which includes durable medical equipment, eyeglasses, hearing aids, insulin, um, psychological services, peer support, whatever it may be, that 
those types of interventions enable us to be able to be regular members of our community. Judy, I think, I think that, that, that leads nicely to, to the reality that if you don't get the support you need, then the diversity of ability can't convert to being an asset. I mean, I think we need to understand diversity as an asset, diversity in every way. But if you don't have what you need to be able to participate, it doesn't convert to an asset. And I think this whole explosion of activism in the country needs to be framed in terms of how do we actually take all of the, all of the aspects of diversity and convert that to how is it an asset that we need and can use? And I think that's, you know, that's always been so much, uh, you know, what you've been driving for. If people get what they need, they contribute, they belong, they are part of the community and they add to that community. And they can become fighters in the community. And they can I become think when fighters. You ask the question, <laughs> do I have hope? And the answer is I do have hope because more and more people see that they have rights, that they have not necessarily uh, been able to actualize and that they have a right to be demanding that their rights um, are ensured and that we need to be looking at our system more holistically. And, um, you know, I think many other discussions on this, but I definitely have hope that people need to continue to believe that our society can change, that we can make a difference at the polling places, that we have to really be fighting against voter suppression. And that to me is a, an issue that we all need to be concerned about. Suppressing people's right to vote is not democratic. It is not the American way. And we need to get people out of office who believe that minimizing the number of people who have a right to vote because they're afraid of losing their positions mm -hmm. is not the way we need to be moving forward. Which is why we need a Senate, which is controlled by people who are not trying to put judges into positions who are gonna vote against um, positions which ensure that every person who has a right to vote gets that right to vote. Judy, um, you've, you've made such an enormous contribution for such a long time. May you have many, many more birthdays and continue your, you. your acuity of thought and passion uh, for a good long time. And ditto um, to you. And everybody, <laughs> I'm sorry. So one of the great things about the virtual is I'm sure there are people here who would not have been able all to convene in a room I would love to be able to have a combination where those of us who could come into a room would be able to, and at the end of this could go off and have all kinds of different discussions <laughs> and schmooze and go get a cup of coffee, a piece of cake, think about other things. But we'll have to say adieu at this moment. And uh, I really, Valerie, so much thank you for inviting me. We are in your debt, my dear. Um, I look forward to seeing you in person one of these days soon. Me too. Bye, everybody. Aviento. <laughs>